Hello, Rachel. How are you doing? Oh, Rachel, I am ecstatic. We、Ooh. got a lot more Christian and Aaron Wright. Yeah. And so, of course, I'm happy to be sitting here today to talk to you about an episode of the. You're、Expanse. such an Earther. I am an inner through and through. It's where my allegiances lie when it comes to my attention for this series, and it's where the yum yum lives in the expanse. But、uh, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, Rachel. How about you bring us back down to earth with that gravity of yum yum podcast? Yeah, Ryan makes us explain why we're called yum yum. Every episode, which I get, but I get tired of having to explain it. You want me to explain it? No, no, I'll do it. You asked me to do it. Okay. So we're named Yum Yum Podcast after a defining moment in not just television history, but history. Period. In Star Trek Discovery's second season, an individual was paid to say "yum yum," but the script didn't call on her to say this about food. No, no, no. Okay, what about then? Don't. I don't like it when you do that. What? When you pretend like you don't know "yum yum." I'm. Saying it on behalf of the people listening because they may not know. I think anybody who's listening to this episode knows Yum Yum. I disagree. Some people may have heard about our podcast for the first time right now, and so they're tuning into this episode specifically to know our opinions on the expanse, and they don't know anything about Yum Yum. So we have to explain it, and somebody has to ask the questions on their behalf, such as. Why is Ryan getting picked on so much for that, Rachel? It's because she's my wife, and she's allowed to do that. And as a husband and wife podcasting team, my role is to make sure that Rachel explains Yum Yum in detail. It is her response as an individual. Saying character would be an overstatement. To do you want to go kill the? Antagonist. So their response is yum yum, and we were left in its wake. It was a monumental moment, and we needed to discuss it. And so we started a podcast in which we talk about episodes of science fiction television one at a time. We've done Discovery. Been through Babylon Five, or at least making our way through it, and now we are going through the Expanse for the first ever time. We have not seen this series before doing it for this podcast, so please, no spoilers. But if you are interested to hear more of our discussions, we release this on Patreon first for our patrons there. So if you are starving to hear about what we think of the rest of this season. Head on over to our Patreon to hear it right now. But I am starving to know which episode of the Expanse we have before us. So I'm going to read the description and title from IMDb because although we have this on the Blu-ray, modern television shows don't include episode descriptions. We don't get lovely little booklets anymore, and if we do, it's not very often. So. IMDb has been giving very straightforward plots to these episodes, so we are here to talk about episode ten of season two, Cascade. And here is the summary: Holden leads his crew through the war-torn station on Ganymede. That is Cascade. No, that's one of the plots. <laughs> like, but Holden doesn't lead them. Prax does. Holden's there to say, "Sure, I, I'm a I'm a character too." We've got a husband killed. Those cops were going to kill them both. It was the right move. And I keep telling myself that. If we do what we came here to do, I'll figure out a way to live with it. 
Yum Yum had an inherently sexual energy and quality to it, that line itself did, the delivery especially, and so we like to have a little bit of cheeky, delightful fun and tell you what made us want to lick our lips, throw our hair back and say, yum yum. And and which bit of Christian was it for you, Ryan? I am going to be a noble man and choose something other than Christian for this episode. But are I'm, you being honest with me? I am are going to be. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not only going to be noble, I'm going to be brave and honest. I'm going back to one of the facets of this series that isn't explored enough, which is out and out horniness. There was a lady who came out of a certain crime lord who loves chicken. She came out of his room topless, mm-hmm. holding what looked like chicken tins or food or whatever near her bare naked breasts. And I, I, I stood up from my seat. I clapped and said, it's back. It's back. Direct references to sex and horniness is back in this show because it is strange how often- It's gone through it, a dry spell. How often this series reminds you because- you really think it's going to be a lot more horny than it is considering that one of like the lead character is introduced via zero g sex and then it's really not around for the most part no. we we no, no. it's slightly inferred from here to there and maybe we will directly see it once a season premiere but i have to give it <laughs> once a season premiere just mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said what i said so what is your regular selection? Because Rachel likes to have an automatic Amos pick in which she lets us know why Amos got her hot and bothered this week. But what is your normie pick? Well, <laughs> um, I thought you were going to go with a Christian pick, so I thought I was going to get topless chicken lady, but I guess not. I guess not. You can choose her if you want. We can have a consensus. Okay, I choose her. But what is your automatic Amos pick? I was looking in the episode thinking, ooh, there's a lot of material for Rachel Mm -hmm. to really choose from, and I don't know what it is that you're going to land on, so please tell me, tell me, tell me. I I think you do, because it's the one that I said out loud back to you. (laughs) What was it, Ryan? you got to tell our yumlings that's you, the folks listening at home or on the bus or at the, at the graveyard. I don't know where you listen to this podcast. It could be anywhere. You could be doing anything right Amos now. Amos said some people just deserve to be punished. And I turned and said to you, does that mean I deserve to be punished? It was very uh, uh, scary when Rachel said that because the context of him <laughs> saying that was very was very unfortunate for Rachel to decide to get like that <laughs> right next to me. And he's I kind like, of he's uh, opening up about his traumatic backstory. Uh, uh, I, uh, this I'm going to be I'm going to be real with everyone. <laughs> When Rachel, I'm when, I'm excuse me, I'm being real for a second. Let me be real. Let me dream. Get real. Get real. Uh, <laughs> let me get real. When you just asked if I could repeat the moment for everyone, I actually didn't remember because I cringed so hard when it happened in the moment that I blocked it from my memory because I thought, well, no, block Rachel it can't. From the edit. No, don't. it's in. No, it's no, in. No, Sorry, no, no. it's in now. No, Bye. No, no, Sorry, no. it's in. Sorry, you don't control me. What did you uh, feel towards this episode? I enjoyed it for the most part. I I like that it it's ratcheting up things nicely. Wow, you sound so thrilled about it. It's like a gun is put against your head sometimes when I ask you your thoughts on The Expanse because, in all honesty, when an episode of The Expanse is great like this one, it, it almost uh, comes at a, a in a begrudging way because it is done so efficiently that it, it almost is hard to give it a compliment in a lot of ways because to say that this episode was good 
or to say that this episode was wonderful, spectacular, great. It makes it harder to critique because it's just like, well, that was good and that built on that and the cinematography was really nice and I thought the direction of all of the actors was really good. I like their way that they're building up this and they're paying off this thing and they're going back to these dynamics, but they're creating a new edge to them. There's a lot of stuff happening, but it doesn't feel like it's happening at you or at a breakneck speed. And it's just like, well, what do I say now? Sometimes, it was good. Sometimes when you just say this is good, it, it, even though we aren't sitting in the same room as people who have watched this series from back to front, I can just sense the consensus of, yeah, we know it's good because it's The Expanse. It's a good show. And the highest praise I'm going to give this particular episode is that this is what I like about the show. The entirety of this episode, the, the Holden stuff, Amos, even Alex with his, with his little moment here, as well as all of the intrigue politically going on with Earth and Chris Jen and Bobby and Aaron Wright, the tone of this episode, the pacing of it, the way we are furthering the stakes, as well as coming back to touch on character moments, how this is all constructed, and just the feeling it gives me when I was watching it, as well as just leading into talking about it right now, this is what I like about The Expanse. This is what I want more of. This is what I got from the season two premiere episode. This is what I got from the last episode. This is what I desperately wanted in the first season. This this exact episode is what I have been craving, and if there's way more uh, episodes like this in our future, then I'm going to be far more comfortable, because I, I can't speak for you, Rachel, but I have been feeling a little bit off balance or guilty in a way for not liking the show as much as its reputation has led it to be uh, this great series, and or even when I have discussed episodes with you, there's still this part of me that's like, yes, I'm complimenting this and I'm breaking this down, but I wish I liked it more than I do. And I'm getting to that stage now where I'm actually reaching my own want of how much I like it and still see that there is room ahead for this to keep improving. Uh, where are you at with that uh, overall? Because you have expressed from time to time on this podcast that The Expanse hasn't uh, always been grabbing you in that way. No, but we are at that section of the plot arc that I do prefer. We're not stuck in setup anymore i'm not as like in it as you are like i do not have set expectations for the show it's a show that you wanted to watch thus you watched like the first few episodes and, but then stopped whereas i was just like oh uh, yeah whatever you, you didn't even know of its existence yeah, I misremembered what decade it was made in. Uh, other than just this being out of the setup phase of the story arc, what about an episode like this gets its hooks in you a little bit more than some of the others? It is character-based without being character-focused. It matters that our characters are in this place at this time with this point of view and their current experiences. It's so specific to them, but that doesn't override the plot. It's part of their journey as characters. So it's very satisfying to have that sort of symbiosis happening to such a high quality. We have come to this stage with the characters now where those initial growing pains have ceased and 
the series itself, the writing itself, and even the performances are reflecting back on them. That often happens with a show. You say, for example, look at Space Above and Beyond, a series that we have covered that as each episode of The Expanse passes, the more I think about Space Above and Beyond and just how much these two have in common, in which that series had to set up expectations so that it could subvert them. It had to make sure that we were familiar with the character types and uh, themes that it was uh, feeding us so that way it could deconstruct them. And that is very much how the expanse has been operating. And sometimes, uh, that can be a little frustrating. I love Deep Space Nine, for example, but there are some characters in the early days of Deep Space Nine that frustrate me to tears. And they're ones that I love because it's the journey that they go on. And so when you go along that journey, you can look back about how they used to be a fucking annoying character, but they've matured and the writing has matured and maybe them starting out as a holier than thou figure like James Holden actually had a specific purpose in mind, but we are no longer just in the, I understand that there's a purpose in mind. We are now in the place where we are actually seeing it come to fruition because I loved what they did with Holden in this episode. I think that the writing was really, really like sharp with him without it being so heavy on focus of Holden. The less he said was more telling to me than the more he used to say in this show. Yep. That was very reminiscent to me of Nathan West in Space Above and Beyond, where you start out the show and he's so f- much the lead character. He is just focused on so much that it almost drowned out a lot of the a lot of the importance. And that's how I feel about Holden. I I actually had a sigh of relief when he basically offhandedly dismissed having to draw out the emotional baggage of what happened at the end of the last episode. Because that's what he used to do all the fucking time. Just like, I I don't have time for this. I don't have the energy for this. Let's just get through this next problem. If I live, then I will think about the emotional baggage that I'll have to carry for fucking something else up. And I was just so relieved that that was something done because... (sighs) Holden has been a character that has been one that I flip-flop on because I see the merit to him, but I also grit my teeth because I know that any little thing that gets to him is going to be a big fucking saga for the guy. He just, he has a hard time getting over things, and even if he can get over them, the story will make it spin out into something that's more ongoing than I want it to be sometimes, and I just really like that they are reducing that, and via doing that, it actually makes me think about his mental space more. And it's because they've ingrained in us that Holden is such a moral character, a guy who is deeply concerned with his soul and his innocence and and his appearance, that now when he isn't concerned with those things, it makes you worried about him. The stuff with Holden is interesting, but I actually feel more intrigued by Naomi's response to that and the line that she has that's basically to the effect of, well, yeah, every bad thing we do makes the next bad thing easier. And that Holden doesn't have that anymore in the same way. He's just free falling. And it is concerning because we're used to him being a moral touchstone. Someone who's aware of the ramifications of their actions. They may not always be correct about them, but he is someone who has been concerned 
and here we see him detached. He's actually acting a lot more like Amos <laughs> in that way. He actually lets Amos go hog wild on this uh, crime lord figure on Ganymede, and Naomi has to try and call Amos back, and <laughs> Holden does this. Holden stops her. Yeah, he hugs her like he's going to protect her. And the way Stephen Strait plays it and his physicality behind it, it's almost like it was just a an, a gesture on Holden's part. Like he doesn't. It's not, I don't. I don't actually feel like he was genuinely concerned for Naomi's no, well being. No, it was it more like a, a, a sign of like, oh no, I'm here to protect yeah, you. It, it's, it, it wasn't. It's half hearted. It was, you're not getting involved with this. That's how I read it. Oh, yes, I uh, see you that. You stay read. out of this. Mm-hmm. I also saw it as the, I'm protecting you. I'm protecting you because I'm your boyfriend. Like he had that. It's a whole mixture of things. Yeah, it's no one thing. And that's part of what makes this episode good is that we know these characters well enough and we know the world well enough that we can appreciate the shading in a small decision like the expression and the blocking of a specific moment in a a scene. Like, that's probably like two seconds, but we can spend at least two minutes talking about that decision. A lot of jobs ahead of you. A lot of work for other people. You got chicken? That's what I like. Gonna take a lot. You guarantee results? No. That doesn't give us much faith in your work. He has a savior complex that has been taught into it. Taught and bred into him because of his upbringing. And we have been seeing it blossom in many ways over the course of this season in particular. It's no one thing that's done it. And it doesn't look like just one thing either. There's always a new wrinkle to Holden's hero complex. And I'm really coming to appreciate him as a character because they're keeping it fresh. But more importantly, even though he's the got the hero complex and he's the hero and the show thinks he is heroic in many ways as, as well... I, I, I'm not feeling it as aggressively as I was in season one where there it's were not many like, look, here's a hero. And also look Holden, he's a hero. Yeah, and also look, he's a bad hero because he's like Don Quixote or all of these obvious symbolisms and metaphors to where he is at. I'm no longer thinking, why is this person talking to Holden like I was in season one? He has established himself very much so at this point, and I'm actually keen to see where he goes. I've always appreciated the performance behind it, and I think the writing is catching up to where Stephen Strait has been since the beginning of this series, because again, I think he's always been very good, and I've always just had an issue at times with how they position Holden, and I think they're positioning him really well where He's kind of a shitty dude. He's a kind of shitty dude now, wouldn't you say? Yeah, he's no longer the knight in shining armor that he was presented as when he gave the message from the cant. Or about the cant. They are on Ganymede Station, as that wonderful IMDb description stated to us, and they have to find Prax's daughter, as well as this Dr. Strickland character, uh, because there's probably proto-molecule here. The mad scientist pediatrician is probably injecting these children or people with proto-molecule, because isn't that how it always works? And... I I I loved so greatly that doctor or that nurse that they were talking to and how she said like look I've I've not seen anything like what you're describing do not spread this around the station because you're just going to make we're dealing unnecess- with enough you're just putting unnecessary panic here when we do not need it and he came away, as did Naomi, looking like a bunch of idiots in that conversation. Like, yeah, what did you expect? They were not at all subtle about it. Holden, 
He is not a good actor. No, no. Like, if, if we saw that last episode as well, when he's like the one that gets discovered kind of first when they're trying to board the ship stealthily. Uh, and uh, he can stand his ground when needed to, but to do this thing of, hey, I'm just quietly investigating this thing. I'm not going to raise any red flags. He, he has no way of no, doing that. No, he's no, always no. raising red flags. He's always very obvious in what he's trying to achieve. And that's okay. Yeah, there's a place for that. There's a time for that. I think there's humor to it now. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I think they are aware of how kind of funny it is that Holden is a dipshit. Yeah. Who can't get his shit together in the first place. And yet here he is on Ganymede, a place where he shouldn't be, sticking his nose where it shouldn't be in other people's business and shaking up their lives, ruining it for many as well. Uh, We have people going around the station trying to figure stuff out. We have Prax. And Amos, they're a they're a team. They're, they're buddied a duo. up. There's a lot of plant talk. Yeah. They are trying to figure out where Strickland is, where he was during the incident, and if he had escaped. So they know for a fact he is alive yep. because of the computer system brought it up. And so the Rossi crew are trying to find some colleagues of his that may be aware of where he is now. Uh, Prax and Amos are trying to do that, and I could not help but be distracted, and I know there's a reason for it, because they had their plan, but Amos is carrying around a big bag during most of these scenes, and I just couldn't help but notice it because they're having these intimidating scenes of these very personable scenes between Prax and Amos, and you have this actor with this big, big prop that he's holding, Mm -hmm. and he's and the straps on him, and he's a big muscly guy, and that was my automatic Amos pick, was just his muscles when he was (laughs) holding this big bag. And I just, and I was you in that moment where I'm like, I'm listening to the scene but my eyes are looking at that strap like holding on for dear life to those rippling muscles and I a strapping young man oh 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 let's end the podcast right there but what happens during their investigation Rachel they stumble across a few interesting things and people and we get the title drop oh that does that does happen Mm -hmm. but uh let's rewind to how they find out about... We mentioned this crime lord guy, but we haven't actually mentioned how they know about there being a crime lord figure on Ganymede. Uh, Very conveniently, there's another dad there that also had a sick child that was under the care of this assumingly evil doctor. Uh, And he says, there's this chicken man. He loves chicken. If you give him chicken, he'll find the footage. Um, And then they go and find the man. Amos is aware straight off the bat that this guy must be a scam artist because he doesn't take money. Yeah, He no. takes food, mm-hmm. which doesn't line up for an actual organized criminal of any sort. But the more we learn about Ganymede Station the more obvious it is why this guy wants food because there is no food on Ganymede Station. Hence the reason the weeping somnambulist was coming to the fucking station with food and medicine, you dummies. And then you ruined it for everyone. But I I just wanted to call that out because Amos is, is, is very confrontational in this episode, but... From life experience, yeah, he he sees this father who's losing his uh wit, like he's at his wits end, and he calms him down. He he disarms him in a lot of ways. He he speaks to him in a very friendly manner, but there's still a a hierarchy. There's, there's also a threat there of like, hey, 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 sit down, calm down. I could. He, there's always this hint of violence in his voice yeah. when he speaks. He's always ready for a fight. 
And he's always ready to prove who's the most strong in the room, and that's him, obviously. Yep. And I really liked how uh, Wes Chatham played the the scene there because he he makes Amos so likable. Yeah. But always intimidating. Mm-hmm. He never comes across as a teddy bear of a character. No. At least no. not in my eyes. I don't know if he is uh, in that in yours because you find him so attractive. But like, I never think of him as like a Amos as a teddy bear. I think of him as someone uh, who shock. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, he 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 has the he has a warmth, <laughs> but it's still got that anger behind it. He's always someone that I teeter on being uncomfortable around. Interesting, yeah. I get that. Because he could pop off. Yeah. Which he does in this episode. Uh-huh. Uh, what, what did you think about this lead-in of the, of the Chicken Man character? I know he has an actual name, but we're going to keep calling him Chicken Man. Mm-hmm. He wants chicken. They go to his room, and there's he a lady a with- a lot of chicken. He has so much chicken. And, and it's, it's- I even steal some of that chicken. Oh, he earned it. <laughs> he earned the chicken, Rachel. You seem to be doing quite well for yourself. I mean, you got enough here to feed half the station. Put that back. This guy just wants to find his little girl. She's sick. She could die if he doesn't find her. This business. So the chicken man tries to swindle them. Saying, I only accept chicken. Which which they don't have. And Amos is just like, fuck you, motherfucker. Um, And beats the crap out of him, which Holden not only allows. But appreciates. Yeah. He, yeah. He seems wrapped by it. He's like, oh, thank God Amos did that because... It was going to be me if not. Uh, and, and you missed the important detail. He beats him in the head with one of his chicken tins. Yeah. <laughs> he? You know what's very... Do you think that's the one that he's eating later as well? Oh, of course. What was very weird to me is he beat him so fucking good. And yet when we cut back to the guy after... The beating. He seems Doesn't, relatively yeah. oh, like his eyes a bit bloodshot, but and he's got a little bit of like he's got a little bit of a s- no permanent head. looking damage. It doesn't look as nasty as what Amos was doing, and I I had a bit of a disconnect there. I'm like I feel like it would be a bit nastier looking compared co- like with what we saw yeah, him. This doesn't line up. It didn't line up for me. No, no, but. He, uh, what did you think of his performance, the, the chicken man guy, and his look? Because he's shirtless, he's got this hair that goes up to, like, he has really tall hair. He's got these buggy Thick eyes. Thick belter accent. Oh, he made me miss the gaunt belter. He did, my boy. I loved this guy. I don't know if he's in any more episodes, but I loved him. I thought he was great. I love these type of characters, these shitty level crims who think they're really hot shit but they're just absolute losers he is delightful i i i smiled mm-hmm. when he was on the screen he had a look they per- they whoever this actor is he was perfectly cast as guy who is who is handsome in his own re- in his own way but he just oozes pathetic he's slimy Slimy yeah. boy. I I thought he was I thought he was great. Well, what about you? What did you What did you think of this guy? Oh yeah, he's a greasy, slimy motherfucker who has found a niche and has been able to rise to the top of the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a that's a great way to put it because. Ganymede has been royally fucked and they've managed to pick themselves back up and he has risen to the top as this man with a certain set of skills that are required in this time and he is extorting people for food because he cleverly has figured out that that will be very important soon. Uh, It's also like, 
I think he likes chicken. Oh, yes. He very much likes chicken, but- He wants to guarantee that he has a supply of chicken for the future. Amos deduces as well, he has enough food to provide to a lot of the people on the station because people are starving. They're eating the plants. The plants aren't- That have no nutritional value. But they're that desperate. And he is sitting on this treasure trove of goods. And although not explicitly stated by the man himself, Amos makes it very clear that although he may like chicken and he may just be looking after it for himself, he's making a market. There's going to come a point where he will step in and give these people this, but for a cost, because he's a bully. And where Amos come f- came from, we don't tolerate bullies. Better not be a bully because I don't like bullies. Prax asks him how many people he has killed, and he does not know. But he isn't a maniac. Like, I'm not a maniac. No. And I was hoping that he would also bring up, well, it's just like, well, how many, how many deaths have i done like has is amos personally responsible for and how many are as a result of his actions because alex feels the weight of that whole set of belters on that like little rinky dink tin can that died so that they could save amos Mm. does amos feel like he killed them. Oh. No, not, no. no like, oh, yeah. I thought you were flipping it around of, in Amos's worldview, it could be, I don't know um, how many people I've killed, but I also don't know how many people I've saved via killing. Yeah. Because that's a lot that, of that the reasoning be, for why like, he does these oh, things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, it doesn't make sense for Amos to have that question of, like, oh, I wonder if I'm um, responsible for these deaths. Like, that's not not his M.O., but I was wondering about mm. that. And Prax and is wondering, wondering on it, on, yeah. wondering on, on it too, because Prax is new, and it's so weird that his best friend is is Amos, but because Amos is the only one that spent time with Prax. And is honest with him? Yeah, they, they have a very open relationship with how they discuss things, and I, I like their friendship or their yeah. camaraderie. They... they, they it's an interesting dynamic to explore. I put it on the actors as as well. These these two actors just have a certain Found a groove with each other. Screen screen presence that is very alluring when they're on their own. I can watch the guy who plays who plays Prax, uh, Terry Terry Chen. I can just see him doing whatever he's doing, like we did in in the previous episode when he was introduced. And he is very captivating, and the same can be said for Amos. But when you put them together, it's just really, really electrifying. And I am just glued to my seat, and I can't wait to see more of their conversations. Amos opens up about his life. Just a little bit. Just a little bit about how where he came from, there were men like this man, bullies, that would you know do horrible things to to women, for example, whore them out when they were children or when they were older, and then if they got pregnant, take them off the streets and then put them back on once they gave birth, even if oh, they hadn't healed. No, but I I liked the in oh right, it was it was oh give them to freaks who like that type of thing. Yeah, the yeah. people who wanna. <laughs> Fuck them while they're pregnant. That's it, yeah. And then put them back even if they haven't healed and it fucks them up. And then they'll use the children as well later. And without saying it explicitly, he was one of the children. He That was him. That was his yeah, life. Yeah. And so I think it's safe to say I have a bit of a grasp on what Amos is background is now from things that we have You've been gathering pieced it together you have you been in the piecing it together way or are you still just along for the ride and along see along for the ride 
What I mean, with what we've got now, what is his story to you? Well, yeah, he grew up around prostitution and probably was either witness to it, definitely witness to it, if not subjected to that. I think kind of abuse. I think that's what's being inferred here. Yeah, um, yeah. We know from other episodes that his mother had to go through this. Um, that, or at least, women important in his life or mother figures have had to go through this, and it's been a horrible ordeal. Uh, he but feels very protective about uh, them. And what role Lydia played in that? That is that is still up in the air. But with the with the way he talked about in this episode and how he just described those events, it is so clear to me that he was a child who had mm-hmm. to work in that realm, and that's really fucking sad and disturbing and it makes a lot more sense as to why he looks at the world the way he does and how he interacts with people and why he has Mm -hmm. these yeah the rules these misgivings about others especially men because a lot of his issues have been with men and a lot of his strong connections have been with women uh, and not in a sexual way either. Like he, he even says like, although you know, if Naomi wanted to fuck, I would totally be down for that, but I'm actually pretty good with how we are. And we had a bit of a chuckle about that, but with what is given here, it it just fills in that relationship yeah. a lot more mm-hmm. without explicitly saying how Naomi and Amos met and why they have this uh, uh, almost brother-sister protective of one another uh, dynamic. As a, someone who's a big fan of Amos, um, what I mean, what is it about Amos that you're a big fan of and how is that... Uh, changing or developing when we do get more pieces of the puzzle to his life. I like that he, he, on the surface he's a burly blokey bloke who does the things. He's a buff dude, he gets the job done. But He's not just that, and they're interested in exploring how somebody gets to that point of appearing that way. They're digging through the layers, and I find that really interesting because it's not its not the version of that character that we see all the time because often it is. They're a teddy bear. Once you get to know them, like, you know, like Jane in Firefly. He's got a (laughs) cute hat. A town sings songs about him because he's a hero. It's weird that you chose Jane as an option because I haven't watched Firefly in a very long time and I always think of Jane as still just as a prick. Yeah. Well, that's the difference too. Jane is a comedic buffoon. Yes. He's 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 the butt of a joke. Mm-hmm. He's never really a nuanced character. No. And Amos has never really been the butt of the joke. No, that's that's not him, but you can see how that might have played out that same way. I don't know why I went with Jane. Well, well, no, I understand why you do say Jane because Jane is this blokey bloke guy, but there's some interesting things about his psyche and how he rubs up against the other members of the crew. And maybe if that show went longer, we could have got more. But weirdly enough, when I think of Amos, I think of him as a a counterpoint to Dargo from Farscape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dargo is introduced as like the hothead, angry guy. That's the threat. He causes the drama all of the time. But Amos 
could be that, but isn't really that. The way that they do it is not as overt as that. And Dargo also becomes like a bro and a goofball. And Amos hasn't become that either, really. Like he's been deeply familiar with some of the other characters. Like him and Holden have a bit more of a a working relationship, like their colleagues and Alex and Amos have had far more of that we are bros, but they're on the outs at the moment. They're not on the strongest of terms right now. They've had a little bit of uh, uh, disagreements on life. They've hit a rough patch in their relationship. What I've really come to appreciate about the character of Amos is he's an emotionally stunted man he is one that you juggle up in the air if he's, if he's a sociopath or a psychopath. Like, what is his mental state? But he is someone that is unaware of how deeply empathetic he is. That's why I find him super fascinating, because he is so attentive to people. But he doesn't really know how good he is at that. So when people open themselves up to him, he does just say like, oh, am I supposed to feel bad about that? Or am I supposed to say this to you? He doesn't understand those things. But there are so many other moments where he just does that off the cuff. He makes people feel comfortable. And he goes out of his way for people a lot more than some of the other characters do. So Prax is this man that is neglected by Holden and Naomi and Alex, but but Amos goes out of his way to talk to him and, and... Treat him like a person. And tries to understand him. Amos is always trying to understand things because mm-hmm. he's inquisitive. Yes. He wants everything to fit into his puzzle. And it doesn't just live in that that cold realm of trying to understand things that fit in a puzzle, it really does evolve into this warmth. There's this shot of Prax inside of the greenery. Like, he's opened up this door, and he's in there, and he's fiddling with wires and stuff, and you just get these tight shots on Amos's eyes looking through the shrubbery at Prax, and he's happy. Yeah. Like, he's like, well, what are you doing in here, buddy? Oh, hey, and, yeah. and I al- followed you here. And although Amos is, and the actor who plays him is this big, muscly guy that can be scary as fuck as he wants to, like, whenever he wants to be, I, I, I think of those shots a lot more of him having this glint in his eye of, like, excitement and joy, and he's he's genuinely interested to learn about all of the stuff that Prax is rattling on about. The Prax is so much into plants, and he's doing that typical sci-fi thing of he's doing the uh, techno babble. Yeah, yep. And Amos does a uh, a good riff on the classic art. Uh, Translate that into English for me because I'm not mm-hmm. smart like that. And he does a really clever little riff on that where it's like you know he, he just very. Very nicely says, like, I don't I don't really know what you're referring to, but, like, I'm interested. But I also really appreciate that Prax doesn't do the, okay, it's like this. It's like, no, he still talks like a botanist, like a scientist. He doesn't talk down to Amos. He explains it. The joy in his voice does not change. In that scenario, you can see it be like, oh, right, I'm talking to an idiot. It's like this. He goes, oh, well, well, it's this plan over here. Like, he, he is, he, they're both just so happy to talk about plants. And they're, them stumbling across this greater issue with Ganymede Station was one of my favorite things of the episode that. These two guys from two wildly different backgrounds and wildly different personalities connecting with one another and being paired to one another and working really well, even though Amos explodes and and Prax is dumbfounded by him, they still have a certain working uh, relationship that, that... Who would have guessed them talking about plants 
would be one of the most riveting things in an episode of this series. I I, I was all on board for these two guys getting into the nitty gritty about coloration of of of, of flowers and plants and and vines and 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 things like that. You're using distilled water in the hydroponic supply instead of the proper mineral solution needed for long term stability. That sounds bad. I'll only be able to get away with it for another week, maybe two, and after that, the air, the scrubbing plants, what's left of them, will die off. When that happens, they won't be able to stop the cascade. And he's figured out that they're not using the right water. So we're like, hmm, what's going on here? Um, and he explains that the whole ecosystem on Ganymede, which is, as Amos reinforces, it's one of, or if not the most important food source. In in the system, in, yeah. Yeah. Um, Earth and Mars need it. Yeah. And it is very vicarious because it is it's all of these things but it's paired back to the essential parts but that's not the way that biology works on earth so you're meant to have all of these different systems and all of these different plants and all of these different things so if one thing goes wrong then another thing will happen. But because everything is artificially created on Ganymede, if one thing goes wrong, the whole system falls apart. Over time, yeah. It's a cascade. Yes, it's a cascade. They drop the title so that we can clap and point at the screen. But it was... Well done, the scene. Uh, how Prax described the slow dawning realization that this station is dead already. It was haunting because we heard from the doctor lady that was talking to Holden and Naomi that this is all going to be okay. We're going to pick ourselves back up. We've got this in the bag. And she was so just adamant about that. And you can tell that a lot of other people there are adamant about it as well, but it's this little issue, it's this little problem that is telling Prax that, no, it's snowballed. It's already snowballed. If this is happening, that means this will happen, and and on and on and on and on and on it goes. And almost it's too late to even try and fix it. It's just like, well, if we don't do this, then within a month this will happen. But he doesn't seem hopeful that they'll be able to fix the problem. Prax, in this scene, talking about how he can determine the absolute failure via his very specific set of skills is very key to how The Expanse explores what being a hero is. Because Holden and Naomi and Amos and Alex and now Prax, they aren't the big game changers in the universe like Chris Jen, like Aaron Wright. They're not people who are the most... Names will be remembered. They aren't... They're not the ones that are going to get songs sung about them. But they will via what they're doing right now because... You don't need to be uh, the president or the secretary general or or, or a a military leader to help change the tides of things and to recognize when things are going wrong. A botanist can do that. People who are just hauling ice can do that. And, and, And Miller... He was just a cop. He was just a, a dumbass PR. Like he just became a dumbass cop guy who fell in love, and he managed to change the change the tides of things as well. And I, I just really wanted to to mention that because 
Praxis specialty is even unique and hard to comprehend for everyone else on the on the Rossi because Amos and Naomi and Holden and Alex they all work together before. They all know what each other's job is in in a pinch. They could fill in each other's roles if need be. It would be a, a you know it would be a pain in the butt if say Alex isn't there to fly the ship, but. They know how to fly the ship if they yeah. needed to. Yeah. But Prax has a certain specialty that none of them can Nine. understand. And he cannot understand their specialties either. Like, it is making the diversity of what it is to be someone that can change things even more readily defined in this show because that is a huge factor, wouldn't you agree? That it isn't just... yeah. yeah the higher ups like christian that will save the day it's the it's the people on the lower ends of the rung of the ladder of power that can do it as well like prax i just really loved it another thing we didn't mention about prax he loves plants a lot but he also has a daughter that's sick and he admits that there's a relief in the idea that she was dead yep the suffering was over. He was like, he is fully like, I'm better with plants than with my kid. And like, that doesn't feel great. <laughs> she was something I couldn't fix. Her illness, as well as her being a child, something you can't control. He he just he has that's a struggle for him and plants are something he can do. They are something that you can just scientifically yeah. break down. And he did that during during all of this. I also looked at him not only using his specialty in plants to help save the day, but it was also for him to cope. Yeah, it was immediate it was what he wanted to do to soothe himself. And he expresses this very hard thing to Amos, and it is a tough thing to admit, and I, I like the honesty of it too, because I don't think that's un uncommon for, say, parents out there to have uh, that strain of a relationship with their child, especially you know, one so young, and it seems like he's a, a single dad. I don't know if he has a wife or, or partner out there. We haven't heard any references no, to we one. we haven't heard about the second parent. We haven't heard about the other parent. So I, I, I like it because it makes his I'm a tragic dad more nuanced as well. It gives it more layers. It isn't just... He's running after his daughter because he's he's you know he's an overprotective father. Him saying like her dying, there was a a little bit of a relief in that for yeah. me, and I felt a relief for her. He got punched in the face by that other dad and called a coward, and you 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 get confused by that at first because. How's he a coward? Hey, look. It wasn't he, his choice to go on the refugee ship. But the more we learn about Prax in the episode and how he has this mentality, you could see why a, yeah. another father would call him a coward. It's not right. It's not fair. But that man's it's in understandable. A, he's, he's devastated, that man. And so he would look at someone like Prax who just went on a ship and left and doesn't seemingly care about his daughter's death as a coward. You know who's here too, by the way? Who? Alex? Alex, who seems to be getting uh, drunk? <laughs> and singing along? Yeah. I really wanted it to be Martian music because because <laughs> it just sucks before, apparently mm -hmm. yeah they reference it and they're like oh yeah it does suck I'm like oh is this gonna be oh he was listening to what was it I can't remember who it was but it was like country and western he was cowboy sounding music because he's all about being a cowboy do they like Alex in this show I don't <laughs> 
Because <laughs> his, his story was, well, his scene, I should say, not story. Yeah, That's yeah. a brave thing. And it's just like, well, he needs to be there because they can't find out that it's under lockdown on the station. What this is, is a simple scene of Alex finding out that the Martians have declared it a no-fly zone, so ships cannot leave and cannot enter the Ganymede station area. That, of course, will be a headache for the Rossi crew to deal with. But the brilliance to this all is... Although Alex is still treated as a bit of a nothing character, because this is all he gets. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't get to be in the exciting mission. He's not really contributing to anything No, but yet. we get a little bit of business with him and the drink and him and Sing, the Singing like a song. And, and yes. all of that, like, it is a filled scene. It isn't... We cut to him finding out about this, and then we cut away. There's more to it. There's stuff around it, so it makes it feel worthwhile and purposeful. And, like, Alex is doing things while we're with the rest of the crew. It's not like he's just nothing and then appears when needed. We reference Star Trek Discovery very much so, hence the name of the podcast being Yum Yum. But The Expanse understands something that Discovery often forgets, which is you can still inject character into necessary plot scenes. So this yeah. is necessary for mm-hmm. the plot going forward. Uh-huh. And, in- and it feels it, but... It isn't only that. It is done in the most characterful way you could do this. He's singing along to music he likes. He's drinking. He's like he does a, a, a flip around. There's CGI effects to it. He's 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 playing around on the ship. He's 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 fiddling with his gun. There's so much being told to us about who Alex is and what he's up to. Instead of this being what it is supposed to be in the script, which is this is the moment where we know that there's going to be more problems for the Rossi crew when it comes to Ganymede Station. They didn't just leave it at that information. No. Discovery, and not just Discovery, but many shows today fail that. They succeed in the script phase of it as we have dispensed information, but it is so often leaving out the things that make... A show yep. alive, and this makes it alive. Although I want more of Alex, when uh, it cuts to him doing this stuff, I, I, I had a big grin on my face. Yeah, it's another time where it's just like people could say, "Oh, it's because in the books they flesh this out and they uh, go into all of this," and it could be that. It could be that. But it is the TV show's choice to spend the time showing that. It's not lazy. This is a very, very competent series. And sometimes it can take the easy route. But here they went with the more difficult one because... They do have, like, an elaborate set piece to him. Yeah. Him floating with the mag boots off and flipping around and sucking up the liquid. They don't need no. to do that. It would be easier not to do that. But they made it difficult for themselves for a reason. Not just because we wanted to have a cool look and scene, but they wanted to make sure that Alex doesn't exist as a character that is there just to be the guy who flies the ship. I am Erica Ortegas. I fly the ship. We have a great escape. Bobby escapes the compound at the UN using cutlery and her. Military on a medal. You're using your mocking voice. Uh, I take it that you are not a fan of any of this? It was... It was... It was... 
and it's dumb. Well, what was that? It was what? It was, <laughs> it was what? Sorry, dumb. It was dumb, but fun. It was dumb fun. You yeah. would say, yeah. She uh, she had to get the rubber off really the window. Spooked by a seagull that we, we just hear and she falls down a building and just toddles off. She gets fucked up on that building too. <laughs> the lead up to Bobby escaping is the Martians say, you fucked up, you are not allowed to go to the ocean, you're going home, so stay in your room, you've been a bad girl. You're grounded, miss. You've been a very bad girl. <laughs> and she says, fuck that shit. Don't you know who I am? I'm Bobby Draper. This I'm is gonna- probably the only time that I'm ever going to get to go to Earth. So what the fuck have I got to lose? Another close yum yum moment for me where it made me lick my lips was when she unzipped the stuff and she reminded us all of just how fucking jacked she is as yeah. she gets ready. I thought she was going to fucking punch the window <sighs> out. Because she was getting ready, and then nah. it was like this nitty gritty little. Okay, get a spoon here and do this, yeah, and get a knife and go through the, the whole thing entire that cutlery. Got me with that was like, she looked like she changed and had a shower. She's been. She. It was a whole day's and activity. Like- <laughs> she needed a rest. What we didn't see in the middle of all of this was when she had a cat nap because it was just <laughs> so gruel. That's that's the training they didn't give her. In all of the Martian stuff, she can run in all of the different gravities and shoot guns and wear power mm-hmm. armor, but having to whittle away at the rubber l- stuff around a window. She's got grit. But not that much grit. That's a lot. That's still tough stuff. But <laughs> we're focusing on this because a majority of the time is spent of her trying to break out. Yeah, yeah they, she wants they to pay see, attention to that detail. She wants to see the ocean. She wants to see the ocean because it symbolizes her hopes, her dreams, Mm -hmm. what she is fighting for, why she's doing any of this. Earth takes it for granted and so do the Martians, it seems. And so she has sacrificed many of her principles and morals Mm -hmm. for them and yet she feels conflicted because she's also still given up pieces of the truth in there as well. And of so, herself. And of herself. And so she is going to defy them no. and say, I'm she, going to the ocean. Yeah. She's not willing to give up on this when she's so close and she's already lost so much. She gets out of there. She stumbles. She falls. And I did think that she was going to have knocked herself out. Mm-hmm. And they were going to think that she was trying to kill herself. Yeah. Because she... I was ready for her to walk into the ocean and just uh, drown herself. I was thinking when she did get to the ocean, would she know how to swim? Yeah. (laughs) If she did get in there. I don't know if Mars has pools for her to swim in because water is a commodity. It's a resource that's very much needed. I don't know if they have swimming pools. Yeah. I don't know enough about Mars. The belter that they had in the tank. To help him with the gravity difference yeah. when Earth was torturing had, him, yeah. Had breathing apparatus and stuff. So. Oh, well, that's on Earth though, right? Yeah, that's how yeah. they work. Yeah. Uh, so Bobby somehow, yeah, she got fucked up on that though. Like that would have fucked you up. The amount of things she fell on mm-hmm. and the heights of those... But she's a strong Martian, so she just she just brushed it off. Determination. But it's like she yeah. was recently very seriously injured. She still has the scar on her face, like the big gash on her face. She still has that, and and she did not get any injuries seemingly from this. It seems like the gravity and the horizon and everything is what's really fucking her up for the rest of the episode rather than the big fall she yeah, just had. It's just like, oh, no, 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 not that. That's fine. That's fine. I, 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 I just loved it, though, because it was brutal. And then how they just said, nah, don't worry about it. We're moving on. I couldn't help but have a bit of a chuckle. Bobby is a character that I still don't 
know if I care for all that much because she goes on this little, uh, let's call it a walkabout, shall we, to uh, the underclass of Earth. And isn't it so nice that they all live right next to the UN? And they even make references to it like, oh, yeah, we've seen Martians before. We live right next to the UN. I don't know if that's realistic. If one of the most important governing places of the entire Earth would even allow homeless people or people oh, near them. I do. <laughs> do you? Yeah, I'd buy it. Like, basically, they're at the Pentagon. Like or yeah, the no, White they're like, House, they're just outside. Yeah, they're so they're pretty they're, close. Yeah, they're they're w- pretty close. Walking but, distance. Yeah, but I think about how, um, oh, that like there's a specific area like in Melbourne CBD that's right next to the Yarra, mm-hmm. walking distance from Parliament has a. Pretty large homeless population. You're right. So yeah, I, I, I get your. I do get your point. Like, and it it's not like tucked away. It's right there in the CBD, and it's very visible. And they've done a lot to try and get rid of it and minimize it. Like the the whole community. <laughs> they oh, they yeah. don't want people there because they don't like the way that it looks. I I will concede on the point there. I think what you're saying is very true. Uh, She she goes to this little shanty town and she is stumbling around and she wants to see the ocean. She keeps Mm -hmm. asking for help and people are either ignoring her or asking for something in return. Hey, give me money. She doesn't have money to give, so she just walks away i i have no clue i was happy with how this story didn't go the way i was expecting it i thought that she would get fucking jacked yeah. from some criminals or some or have earth to people beat up some guy and steal <sighs> yeah. some money yeah and- I, I really thought that she was going to be seen as vulnerable by some scummy homeless people and they would take advantage of her and hurt her or fight her or kidnap her. But and no, they don't demonize homeless people. No, there's there's shown to be some who will be apathetic, like that woman that she first goes to. There are ones who are severely in need of help whether it is uh, psychologically or medically or, or, you know, economically, obviously, but they show that. Um, What this really is going for is not only to tell us and to show us that Earth, we have seen it to be this dysfunctional place, but for the majority of the time, we've seen it only through the lens of the powerful. We've only seen Earth through the lens of Christian, who's one of the most most powerful people. So we haven't really got the chance to look at how the society actually operates. And so here it is. It's people who are down and out. These are people who do not have the ability to progress. We heard about this in the last Mm -hmm. episode. Now we actually get to see it and how they are suffering. And Bobby has demonized Earthers in the past. She she sees them as lazy, as ignorant, as people who take things she for saw, granted. She says that to Christian's face at the end. Like, mm-hmm. you're the enemy. But she says, well, she says two different things there. One, she she says when she actually gets to the ocean that you that Christian takes it for granted. And then she calls Christian the enemy. Those are two different things because one, oh, yes. yeah, the yes. you take it for granted is meaningful now. Before it was a foregone conclusion and and an insult. But now Bobby has experienced these actual people of Earth who can't even take things for granted because they don't have things. They, they are living in squalor. They are suffering through it. And yet there are those still kind enough and wise enough to live through it. While Christian 
Here she is with all of these opportunities given to her and she still squanders them. She can't see the beauty of the ocean because, because she's too busy. And then she calls Christian the enemy because that's the simple way of looking at yes. life. You can't that's be That's what she's been taught. That's you can't what she's been told. You can't you're you're changing my my how I've been indoctrinated. You're the enemy. Not not Mars. That can't be. But she's saying that to comfort herself. This has to be a mind game. You are the enemy. We cannot afford to be enemies anymore. She has to, Bobby, exchange that gravity medication that she has to take with a local drug dealer. But unlike the chicken man, this guy isn't scum. He, at least he doesn't appear to be. The actor doesn't play it like that either. He seems like a genuinely nice dude. He may be playing us. Uh, he may be actually a scummy dude. but And he even says, like, does it matter if that's the truth? He just says to Bobby, you know, what I do with this doesn't really make a difference. We're having an exchange here. I help you, you help me. That's as simple as it is. I'll tell you where the ocean is, you give me the drugs. I'll tell you this tale about how I'm this noble man who wants to do nice things, and I'm somebody who is aspiring to be more than what I am. Whether that narrative is true or not is inconsequential. What it is saying, though, is that idea is rampant on Earth. Mm Mm-hmm. There are people who, if given the opportunity, would be better, but they don't have opportunities given to them. Christian said that as well. which connects to Bobby and her desires for Mars. She makes her way to the ocean. Uh Uh-huh. And he he actually gave her the right directions. (laughs) And she actually gave him the meds. So it was a fair exchange. Mm Mm-hmm. She makes her way to the ocean and she just sits there and puts her feet in the in it. Yeah. And if you had never seen the ocean before, but you know of it and you want to visit it, would mm. you only be content enough to sit at the edge and put your feet in? That would be what I would do first. That like Really? Yeah. I would just go straight in. I like. I would walk into it. Maybe I, not I thought dive. She might, yeah, I thought she might do that. Like just walk in. But I think she's serene at that moment. So the small act of, at like sitting at the edge and not being a part of it, but just bearing witness to it. It's her finally being on her own, only to be met quickly by all of the shit again. Yeah. Here's Chris Jen telling her all this stuff. We better hurry. The Martians are coming. She had a moment of quiet serenity, this, this moment where she could just be in touch with herself and the world and the universe around her. So, yeah, she can just sit there and dip her toes into the water. But before you know it... She will never know peace. But before you know it, all of the plot stuff has to come back onto her because, Bobby, you do matter to the plot, by the way, because you saw a guy out of the suit on, on, on Ganymede. That's crazy. That's weird. And now you need to pick a side. Christian shows her these documentations, like here's the files, here's the proof. Aaron Wright gave her. And we'll talk about Aaron Wright. She gave her the things. Look, is it this is what you saw, correct? Like, I want to help you. Christian wants to resume that conversation, Mm -hmm. but also wants to form an alliance and friendship with Bobby. And we have had issues with Bobby in the past. Yeah. But I could not help but feel sympathetic towards her in this yeah, moment because yeah, it's, it's stressful. It's like, oh, leave her be. <laughs> her world is crumbling around her. Everything she's known, everything she stood for is being tested. 
by Mars, yeah. by Christian, and by herself. Yeah. Facts aren't facts anymore. Yes, that was a thing that was discussed, the truth versus facts. And she is now having to live that. Mm -hmm. And where is she going to go from here with it? She's definitely changed by it. And although still a little early to tell for me, uh, I still am going to discuss it and I want to know your thoughts on it. But Mm -hmm. Bobby, do we appreciate her role in the story more? Yes. I would say that I do. I'm not excited by her as a character. In relation to other characters, I'm interested. You hit the nail on the head. She serves a function in the story that I'm interested to see play out. I like the performer. She does a really good job. But her character overall is one of the ones I find the least interesting in in our roster because the road to here has been not the most interesting. Mm -hmm. She will be someone I am sure by the end of the season or well into the next I will have a higher fascination by. But right now she makes what Kris Jen has to do more interesting yes. rather than Bobby herself being interesting. Yep. She doing all of the stuff she does in this episode makes it so that Christian having a bit mm-hmm. more of pressure to do her role in the story and her job, she she helps mm-hmm. Christian have more dramatic stakes for me to be enthralled yeah. by. And so Bobby serves a function mm-hmm. rather than as a truly formed character that I am excited to see week to week. Which is interesting because that could have been the way that we describe Prax. But because of the work that they've done with him, we don't feel that way. He was also immediately embroiled with the characters we know. Yes. Bobby has been very distant from the characters. which is... And it didn't serve as much as it should have. Yeah. The UN are aware that something was on Ganymede, that Bobby's account has some validity to it, and Christian and Aaron Wright see eye to eye. Yeah. And it upsets her that they see eye to eye. Yeah. That peace is just a distraction from what they're hiding. That uh-huh. they have some new weapon. And she just says it out loud. Oh, you're so right, Erin Wright. And I wish that you weren't. I hate it. I don't like it. That we are actually on the same page for once. And it is eerie. And also... I don't like that that's the truth. It's not just that we both see it. It's that that, that is what's going on here. We, we don't get to ignore that. Aaron Wright has a change of heart. It's not out of nowhere, but it Mal finally... Mal hasn't been answering his calls. It's finally come to roost. Yeah, yeah. He wants to look at that armor. He wants to know... If this incident is related to the proto molecule, because if it is, it's just more deceit from Mao. Because clearly, with what we have been given in this series, he thought they had a mutual relationship and a more honest one as colleagues than what was actually working going on. Together. <laughs> they were working together. He maybe did genuinely believe that this was all in the aid of peace. I don't know if that's oh, true. Oh, but- Earth's dominance in peace. Like, it's not, oh, we're all kumbaya. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's an advantage. It's Earth continues to have a chokehold on Mars and the belt. But Aaron- power stays where power is. Earth first. Aaron Wright thought his partnership with Mao 
was an actual partnership rather than he was just a stepping stone for Mao to do what he wants to do. And now that has come to a full realization with oh, everything that's using gone me on. As a tool. There's no reason to keep up the facade that we, the viewers, have been bathing in for two seasons. And I'm upset to see the facade go away because I liked Aaron Wright in this uh, capacity. in this capacity as the little corporate errand boy who gets nothing in return but feels he has to keep it up because he's afraid and he's a coward and he's a weasel. Although I enjoy that and I love that, I am happy to see him mature and grow and take accountability because he is, at the end of the day, a patriot or someone who does care about Earth because we were actually talking about this last episode. Like, what does he do this for? Like, why is Aaron Wright doing all of this villainous, nefarious stuff? Like, yeah. what's his angle? Like, mm-hmm. why is he dedicating himself to this? Yeah. Is it just power for himself? And I said that I look at it as he gets off on having to implement schemes and ploys because he is a very bored man. He's climbed the ranks. He's made his way up to the top. And now what? What do you do when you're at the top of the ladder? And I'm not saying that that's been dismissed, but they've put more of an yeah. angle and an emphasis on he is a man that wants to make sure that earth is secure yes. so he's willing to do amoral things in aid of that goal mm-hmm. Aaron Wright's turn did you expect it no no but when it happened i wasn't shocked This was a way to guarantee the safety of the Earth. At a terrible price. You're the one who taught me that Earth must come first. And Eris, a hundred thousand souls. Did I teach you that? If I had known what was going to happen on Eris, I would have stopped the project and Jules Piramau along with it. And you know that! Eris nearly destroyed this planet. I really enjoy the conversation that she has with Kocha after. Yeah, this isn't easy. This isn't straightforward. He does deserve to go to prison for what he's admitted that he's done. But that doesn't mean that it's the best decision for her to do right now. And I love the way that he responds to that, being like, I forgot what it was like being on the good guy's side. Kotya is a character that was introduced early on We talked about him, said, hey, we're excited to see him, see what he does, see what he offers up. And he hasn't really done much. No, he's just been there when needed. I've missed him. (laughs) Are you disappointed with what they have and or haven't done with him? No, I'm pretty happy with what has been done. And I recognize that more is not needed at the moment. But he's a character that I enjoy, so I want to see more of him. I think they set him up in a way that I don't think is fair to how he has been implemented in the season. They gave us his whole backstory. They gave us his relationship to Christian. They said that he's going to be a character that will be by her side. But when he isn't, he is in the mud getting information for her and... I never feel like that side exists. He just comes in and says, we dealt with this off screen. Yeah. I I want him to back up the claims that have been bestowed upon him. I want to see more of him like how he was in this episode, but also just I do want those scenes. What I'm saying is I want him to be Mike from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, where Mike... We would actually see him do the things, as well as hear about them. I like Kotya. I think he's a great character, but one that, I don't know, I I guess 
I am disappointed with how they've used him in the season. I, like when you go back in your recollections, Rachel, to his introduction in season two, weren't you expecting more of him? Or was yeah, this what you expected? I, I was expecting more of him, but I quickly realized with the way that they were implementing his character that that was not what I was going to get. Um, yes, I, I I can understand that. But then there are some characters that I thought I understood that with, and then they are just way more like Johnson's right hand woman. Where oh I, okay, they're implementing her in a way that like I understand. And then she just kept getting more stuff to do, and just kept having more characterization. And she we saw her do things and hang out. And Katya, I thought. Honestly, I thought it was going to be flipped around in that way. Like yeah, I thought yeah. he was going to be far more like what she has been given, but on Christian's side of the story. But let's go over to our ratings of Cascades. I am going to give this on a scale of yum being bad and yum yum being good. I don't think it will be a shock to anyone, but I'm giving this a yum yum. Yum yum. Rachel, yum or yum yum? Yum yum. Yum yum. Episode 11 of season two is called Here There Be Dragons. And I don't know what to expect of this next one. Uh, It's got to be Bobby focused because the way we ended on her. Bobby and Ganymede. It's my guess. Yeah, it's got to be similar to this, but yeah. a little bit more heightened in the in the stakes of things. Ganymede, they've got to be chasing after that evil scientist and and perhaps meet him. Do you think they'll meet him? Maybe the end of the episode. Yeah, and they may have to contend with. Uh, I hope they try and save Ganymede, like the plants. Oh, yeah, save the plants. They may have to escape. I don't actually see that happening. I see them finally getting to learn what's going on. Uh, And then in the next episode, the penultimate of the season, that's when they have to escape from Ganymede in an exciting uh, no-fly zone, let's shoot our way out, spin around sequence. But the other thing that I'm really wondering too that may be brought back is OPA. Do you think there'll be any OPA stuff in the next episode or two? Because we've left Tycho and it feels like we've left the OPA there. Yeah, and they like they they abducted the evil scientist and were like, Fred, I have your secret. I'm gonna give it to the <laughs> I'm gonna give it to the rest of the OPA and you're gonna have to worry about what I'm going to do with that and we're after the proto molecule too and if they do crack his research they would be able to track that the proto molecule is on Ganymede as well and would they be bold enough to do what Holden and the rest are doing would they go there who knows that's something that we may see and of course the Gaunt Belter will be leading the charge for that because Anderson trusts him. And I trust him with my whole heart. But anything else to say about Cascade or future things of the series? No. Nah. Well, we didn't address it. But... <sighs> it looks like super soldiers. It looks like super soldiers. Uh, I um, didn't. They look, look. It might it, look. They will get into it more, but it looks like super soldiers, and I'm going to be more disappointed with it in the next episode when they explore it more deeply. In this one, it was she handed over a picture to Bobby, and Bobby's like, "Yeah, that looks like the guy." I, I, it's super soldiers, isn't it? Uh, okay, no, no, we've got to go. I'll be more disappointed about that next week. You can find us on social medias under Yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast. You can email us at yumyumpod at gmail.com. And if you want to hear more of these episodes ahead of time, they were released first over on our Patreon. So if you sign up, you get access to 
all of the ones that we've done. So much content is happening over、so、on many Patreon, loads. and you get to be a part of our group Discord, where you can discuss the expanse as well as many other things with fellow yumlings, as well as us over there. You can rate and review the show、mm-hmm. on any of those podcasting sites of choice, because we are on all of them, as well as YouTube even. So if you aren't following us on those, make sure. To do so, and recommend us to your friends, your family, or your foes, because why not? It would be cool if you did that. But it's time to fly, Rachel. We have to try and get out of this no-fly zone because I hear the Gaunt Belter screaming his way in here, and if he comes in, there's going to be hell to pay. See you then. Well, voila. <laughs> <laughs>